Hi everybody and welcome to Other Ships R&D Tax event. Tonight we have our expert Stephen Tanner here from Leap Accounts and Outsourcing, a partner of Other Ship. You will see some links down in the description on how you can get hold of Stephen at the end of this event and even an offer with Other Ship and to start your accounting and do your R&D tax credits with Leap Account and Outsourcing. Othership is a flexible working platform comprised of four solutions. The first of those being on-demand workspaces that you can book by the hour or day wherever you are for you and your team. We also have a concierge service for people who are looking to find that ideal perfect office or a local membership in a co-working space. Our concierge team will be really happy to match make you to your perfect workspace and private office. If you want to mix of the two as an organization, so you have a base and also access to remote work workspaces as and when you need, then we're able to provide a hybrid solution that combines the two of these together. And lastly, it's all about collaboration and knowing who is working from where, whether it's your own office or any remote location anywhere, then we support you with our hybrid workspace management software. If you want to learn more about these, please check out the links below in the description. Thank you. I'm Steve Tanner. I'm the Managing Director of Leap Accounts. And yeah, something we help a lot of our clients with is R&D tax credits. Um, and therefore, yeah, here to kind of talk you guys through the process, read the kind of slides themselves. I tend to just kind of talk through my presentation. The reason being they are R&D claims are quite technical. So I can't feel like I need to get through all the information. However, to make things a bit more interesting, if anyone has any questions, just feel free to interrupt either in the chat or just speak up and um, we can always, yeah, if there's any points you're not sure on, I'm more than happy to kind of jump off topic and yeah, and address it that way. So just, just let me know. So um, there are actually two schemes available. So the first is the SME scheme. This is the more common one for small businesses and if, if possible, what everyone will be using. Um, and secondly to that is the RDEX scheme, which is actually aimed at larger companies um, but there are instances even for small businesses where you wouldn't be able to use an SME scheme. The most common, and we'll, we'll go into detail on this in a minute, but the most common will be if you get grant funding, um, you may not be able to use the SME scheme. And as a result, we use the RDEX scheme instead. Um, for loss making companies, the great benefit of an R&D tax credit is it's actually paid in cash. So normally with HMRC, any kind of loss relief that you, you guys relieve if, if you're a loss making business, it's normally able to be offset against kind of future profits. There's not too many schemes available where you actually get a cash kind of payment out unless you've already paid some tax the other way historically. That's not the case for R&D tax credits, which is why they're so great for tech companies, particularly as kind of tech or startup companies do tend to make a loss in their last uh, first few years because you're developing your product. So um, yeah, they are hugely beneficial. Um, as I've said, they're usually paid within six to eight weeks of making the claim. Um, at the moment, there's actually quite a big delay with HMRC. So we're, we're seeing things more like 12 to 18 weeks. Um, so it's just something I felt I should flag off, off topic from the slides because yeah, if you guys are looking to make a claim and you need quite quickly, there is a there is a delay at the moment, unfortunately, uh, which yeah, HMRC for you. Um, it's worth noting that if the business is profitable, rather than receiving a credit, you instead you're able to offset that credit against your corporation tax, um, which you otherwise uh, pay kind of corporation tax on your profit. So it's the same, it's the same effect as receiving a cash tax as a check if you're loss making. Instead, you just pay pay less tax the other way. Um, so yeah, SME versus RDEX scheme. So the SME scheme also has a small and medium en uh, size enterprises scheme. It's applicable to companies with less than 500 staff and 100 million euros of turnover. Um, and I say euros because it's, it's based on, yeah, kind of EU rules. Um, or 86 million euros of net assets. So as, as you can see, the vast, vast majority of companies on that basis are going to, um, yeah, they're going to qualify for the SME scheme. So I would assume no one on this call, could, could be wrong, but probably no one on this call is not qualifying for that reason. Um, however, as I mentioned, if the company receives grant funding, a portion of the claim that was covered by this funding won't be eligible for the SME scheme. So instead, you'll need to qualify through what's called the RDEX scheme. Um, the maximum tax credit you can get from the SME scheme is 33.5%, whereas for RDEC, it's only 13%. So as you can imagine, it's far more beneficial to go for SME, and that's why we always try and put for as much expenditure as we can for SME. Um, 
let's move on next to how the scheme itself, kind of how the tax credit is calculated. So for the SME scheme, calculated by taking qualifying expenditure and multiplying that by 130%. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll touch on what qualifying expenditure is in a second. Uh, the 130% figure is what's known as enhanced expenditure. So this is qualified and then, uh, sorry, if you then add your qualifying expenditure to your enhanced expenditure, that gets you to your kind of total amount that you can claim on. And of that amount, you can get a kind of tax credit. So if, if you're loss making, it'll be a, a cash check for 14.5% of that. Um, which, as you can imagine, if you add them together, so 100% of your expenditure plus 130% times 14.5, that gets you to 33.35%. So in essence, the, the simple way to look at it is any eligible expenditure, you can receive a tax credit for 33.5%. Uh, the example I've given below, if you have qualifying expenditure for 100K um, and you would then add enhanced expenditure to that, so that's the 100K times 130%, uh, that gives you 230K total. You then apply the 14.5% to that and you would therefore receive 33.35 uh, thousand. So 33% of the 100K that you actually spent. Um, there are certain restrictions on the amount you can claim um, which we're, we're going to touch on in a bit. So that 33.35 is the maximum, uh, but it does depend on other circumstances. Unfortunately, it's uh, yeah, not, not quite as straightforward as that. Um, regarding the RDEX scheme, it's actually a bit of a simpler calculation. It's literally 13% of your qualifying expenditure. However, there's then a corporation tax deduction of 19% on that, which works out eventually at 10.53%. So your kind of bottom line figure is, yeah, what, whatever you're spending on qualifying R&D expense, you'll get 10.53% back. Um, so the next one is to touch on what qualifies as R&D. So there's three main criteria, all of which need to be met in order for any expense you have to qualify for R&D. Uh, the first is that you're looking for an advance in science and technology. Uh, sounds more ambitious than it needs to be, but I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, the second is an element of uncertainty in what you're trying to do and uh, trying to overcome. And the third is that the project was technical challenging and could not be easily worked out by a professional in that field so i'll touch on each of those individually now because yeah they, these are the three if you're if you're, if you're on this call because you're not sure if you qualify for an r d claim these are the kind of three criteria you need to be thinking was the work we do kind of in line with these these kind of requirements um so advanced in science and technology Business must be able to demonstrate that the R&D they have conducted is pr promoting an advancement in science and technology. Uh, I should probably caveat say attempted. So even if um, even if what you're doing fails in R&D, so you're, you're trying to kind of solve a problem and you end up not being able to achieve that, that's absolutely fine for R&D. You don't need to show any success as such. In, in a way, failure is actually quite good for the scheme because uh, one of the other criteria which we'll get onto is the kind of uncertainty what that means is you were trying to do something but you didn't know you could definitely get there. So actually fa failure is not an issue. Um, so what advanced in science and technology means is the business must be working on something that is already, uh, isn't already being done elsewhere. So an existing technology. So if, if what you're trying to develop is already public and publicly available. So for example, another business is doing it already uh, and you're just trying to catch up, then you're not typically going to be eligible. If it's something maybe the business has, but um, the business has, but it's kind of hidden away, no one particularly knows how it's been done, and yeah, it's not available to you to be aware of, then that's fine. But if you're just doing something that everyone else is already doing, um, you're going to kind of fail on that criteria. Similarly, the advancement must be scientific by nature. This doesn't mean kind of, you know, your typical idea of science in terms of in a lab or anything like that. It just means it can't be academic. So it needs to be you know computer science or yeah actual science so something physical or computer based rather than yeah like an academic paper that that's not going to qualify typically um and finally the advancement must have the potential to have application to the wider community not just specifically for the business so if whatever you develop is something that could only ever be used specifically for your own business for whatever it might be that typically wouldn't qualify it needs to be kind of an advancement. You've achieved something that, you know, a new way of doing something that other businesses, if they had access to that technology, could utilize themselves. So it has to have kind of a wider application. The reason being the whole 
benefit a profit scheme from HMRC's perspective they want to promote the advancements of science and technology in the UK and therefore they're willing to give a tax credit if, if companies are achieving that. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll carry on from where we were. So there must, uh, second criteria, there must be an element of uncertainty as to whether what you're trying to achieve can be done or how it will be done. Um, so as a result, if your tech team already know exactly what needs to be done and how it's going to be executed, that won't be classified as R&D. Um, now, normally this is kind of quite closely linked to the criteria before. If there is a true advancement in science technology per the previous slide, then there's almost certainty, uh, almost certainly going to be some uncertainty in how you got there. And therefore, yeah, this element is normally quite easily demonstrated if the one before is. Um, a good way to demonstrate uncertainty in the technical narrative is to focus on things you tried but ultimately failed uh, and result in how you had to then develop a new approach. Uh, discussing kind of discussing and testing processes within, within the narrative is also helpful. To give an example, just to kind of flesh out these two criteria, a good example of something that wouldn't qualify would be a build, building a website. So even though there's a technical element to that and you're building something un unique that's never been done before, a brand new website, because the underlying technology is already being implemented by lots of other kind of businesses, companies, et cetera, that's not going to be considered a, a advancement in science and technology. Similarly, because the web developer, even if it's kind of a challenging project, he or she knows eventually what they need, how they're going to get to the end of the website as in to build. And therefore, there's not really any uncertainty as to whether they're going to working website at the end of the project they kind of know they're going to get there and how they're going to do it and therefore there's no real uncertainty in whether they were going to succeed so next, the final of the three final criteria of the three is for the work done to be technically challenging for a competent professional in that field um, kind of again similar to what i touched on in the last slide if you're a web developer that designed a website um, that's probably not going to be technically challenging for you because if you're a content professional in that field, that's what you do. It's not kind of pushing the boundaries of your knowledge and expertise. So you need to be showing that for whoever's doing the R&D, so often your tech team, it has to be kind of pushing their limitations of what they know, that kind of thing. Um, and again, another great way to show that people are being pushed to their kind of technical limitations is if, if they failed in attempts in what they were doing, that's a great way to do it. Um, one thing, yeah, not to focus on, something HMRC don't really like is non-technical issues. It's a good idea not to focus on non-technical issues. So if you had someone in HR managing all of your tech team, you wouldn't want to kind of include their costs or talk about the kind of work they're doing. Even though there is a link to the R&D work, it needs to be direct R&D work rather than kind of management of the people doing it. Another example of kind of non-technical work would be if you had an internal recruiter who recruits staff to do R&D work, they're again, they're not technically doing the R&D, so you'd want to leave that out of both the, the amounts that you're claiming, but also any discussion of that kind of work, because it's a bit of a red flag to HMRC that maybe what you're claiming was R&D wasn't actually R&D. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please, Ben. Uh, so now I want to move on to kind of the main costs that people tend to claim. So by far the most common is staff costs. So any in your team that is a salaried employee, if they are doing R&D work, you can claim back the value of their salary as well as any employer's national insurance you're paying on that, as well as any pension contributions you're paying on their behalf. Um, and how, how it normally works, give a, to give a few examples, if you had a kind of data engineer and all they do is R&D, you would add up their salary for the whole year, their employer and I, um, and a pension, and that would all count as qualifying expenditure. Uh, so that that's fairly straightforward. All they do is R and D. Um, in a kind of slightly more complex situation, for example, a CTO, so Chief Technical Officer, they're probably not spending all of their time on R and D, but probably quite a significant amount. So what you'd want to do is look at kind of what they've done for the year and try and apportion that. So if let's say for simple numbers, they're on a hundred k salary, um, and you decide they do yeah, 60% of their time is spent on R&D. Therefore, of their salary of the 100K, you can include 60,000 as qualifying expenditure, as well as 60% of their employers and I and 60% of their pension contribution. Uh, so that, yeah, that's kind of how staff costs work. Second most common is subcontractor costs. So if you're paying someone who's not an employee, but they are still doing work 
for you as a as a subcontractor or a freelancer, you can still claim that cost on the SME scheme. Uh, there are some restrictions on the Ardex scheme, but uh, that can kind of get quite technical. And most people aren't going to be using Ardex. So I, I'm probably not going to delve into that because it's uh, might lead us down a bit of a rabbit hole. But in general, subcontracts costs you can include. However, they are limited to 65% um, of what you can claim. So to kind of add an extra layer of complexity to our calculation, if we had a subcontractor on 100K and all they did was R&D, so you can include 100% of their time, you'd have the 100K, you'd then multiply that by 65% to get you to 65K, and then you'd put that 65K as your qualifying expenditure, you then have the 130% on the 65K, and then of those two amounts, you'd multiply it by 14.5%. And per my little calculation on the slide, that would then get you to 22 uh, 22,000 pounds. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, next most common would be consumables. So this would tend to be more for uh, companies producing something physical rather than yeah, like a software platform. Uh, if you're producing something consumable in your testing to develop that product, you're kind of using something up. Uh, so like you're building prototypes and they're, they're never going to get sold. They're just being used for the purposes of R&D. Any of those items that you're using up can be used. So uh, machinery wouldn't count unless it's kind of, again, being destroyed for once for a better word in the process. But um, any actual items for developing the prototype, uh, prototype would be absolutely fine. Um, similarly, software costs, uh, if they're being used directly for R&D, so GitHub, for example, uh, is absolutely fine to include. Whereas here, yeah, we provide an example of one that wouldn't be is Trello. Okay, wouldn't be included because it's more of a management tool. So similar said, someone in HR managing R&D people wouldn't count. Similarly, Trello is kind of managing the R&D process rather than actually doing it. So that wouldn't count. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please, Ben. I wanted to now. <clears throat> flag some costs that aren't typically eligible. So rent is one that people often ask about. So you, rent is specifically disallowed from an HMRC R&D claim. Even if you kind of have a room where you, all you do in that room is R&D, <clears throat> fortunately you can't claim it. However, what you can claim is light, heat and power. So any kind of bills or costs associated with the property that aren't rent, you can claim. Uh, one thing that's quite common, if, for example, you're in a, a shared workspace of any type, um, something other shipper source for you guys, you can claim, if, if it's all charged in one, you can apportion, obviously that is, even though it's deemed to be rent maybe on the invoice, if it covers all of your bills, you can apportion it out and you can claim the light, heat and power element of that rental payment. Uh, it tends to be fairly minor anyway, but just, yeah, just a tip to consider. Uh, travel costs, a slightly odd rule here where if the company pays for travel costs, they are not eligible. Uh, if an employee pays for travel costs and they're then reimbursed by the company, and if that travel was obviously related to R&D, those travel costs can be included. Um, it's a weird quirk, to be honest, I have no idea why that rule is there, but it's again something to consider if, if there's a lot of travel involved in your R&D work it makes sense to get the employees to kind of pay for that travel and reimburse them. Um, as I touched on already, recruitment fees are specifically not eligible. And I think I also touched on it, capital expenditure wouldn't be. So if buying equipment and machinery related to R&D, if it's used up in the process, that's absolutely fine. But if it's kind of, yeah, equipment that isn't being used up in the R&D process, so a machine or a computer of some kind, that's capital expenditure. And, that's kind of completely separate to R&D. The reason being R&D is all about expense in your P&L and capital expenditure would actually go to your balance sheet, not to get to accounting on you all, but um, yeah, so that, that's why capital expenditure is not eligible. So sorry, maybe, yeah, maybe the wordings aren't clear. So travel costs are, uh, are, aren't eligible unless they are incurred by an employee and then repaid to them by the company. So if your company paid for it, so it's paid from the company bank account, um, then yeah, it, it won't be eligible. But if your employee pays for it personally out of their own bank account and then gives you an expense claim, they would be eligible. Um, hopefully, I think, yeah, it's, I think the wording maybe is, yeah, exactly, double negative. Um, and so just for your question, Alexander, on uh, Amazon Web Services. So yes, yeah, so hosting costs um, are specifically disallowed from being included on uh, in an R&D claim. 
What, a couple of caveats to that, however. Firstly, this is changing, I think, from April 2023. So HMRC have kind of realised that hosting costs are often quite an important part of the R&D process. I think they've yeah, kind of realised their mistake. Uh, I believe it's April 2023, but I may need to check that. That uh, from any expenses incurred after that, you will be able to include it. So, yeah, this is a short-term downside to the R&D claim, but they are excluded. The, the kind of slight except, exception to that is if you use Amazon Web Services, you may see on your invoice, although it's primarily hosting, sometimes there's kind of multiple different lines on that invoice for services they're providing. Um, if they're providing you anything, kind of like elements that, of the overall invoice you could deem to be software rather than pure hosting, um, there's kind of an argument that you can include that. But normally of your Amazon Web Service costs, the vast majority is always going to be hosting. But if included in the service they're giving you is anything that isn't pure hosting, it's yes, yeah, some access to software or anything else like that that you are using for R&D, um, you can then claim that. So quite typically we end up with including maybe five to 10% of an Amazon Web Services cost for the year because there's some, yeah, there's some other elements to that cost that aren't pure hosting. Uh, and yeah, HMRC are generally okay with that. But if they see that you're claiming a hundred percent, yeah. So as you said there, if it's part of your tech stack and it's not pure hosting, it's something else, then you can claim that. And as I say, something like five to ten percent tends to uh, tends to make sure. Um, and it's a good question. Do you then have to explain that in the narrative? Uh, we normally wouldn't directly address that in the narrative. What we would normally address is we would say that we are not including hosting costs so there's a kind of an element of the narrative where you'd outline what costs you have included we'd specifically say we're not including hosting costs and then separately to that another document you need to submit which i'll get onto in a sec is a calculation and in there what you would have is you'd have amazon web services you'd have the percentage so let's say we're claiming 10 percent, and it's there that we put a comment next to that percentage just to say uh, hosting costs excluded, 10% relates to additional software costs, for example. Um, that's where we'd flag it to HMRC. The main reason you want to flag it is the, what you don't want from a R&D claim is HMRC to inquire into the claim because that they have every right to look into the claim. Um, and if, if that happens, it's just an extra time can kind of time use up for you guys, you know. You run your own business you don't want to have to deal with hmrc so it always makes sense to submit everything as thoroughly as possible so that then it yeah normally sets through um and then the final comment on that slide anything else that is not directly related to r d work being done obviously you can't uh, you can't plan uh, if we can move on to the next one then okay so moving on to what actually needs to be submitted uh, i think i've kind of touched on most of these but hopefully i can uh, yeah, build it out slightly. So the first one is the technical narrative, which we've touched on already. Uh, so this demonstrates HMRC, what R&D activity has been uh, taken place and why it meets those three criteria of R&D. They're kind of the main things the narrative is trying to outline. Uh, secondly is the calculation I just mentioned. So uh, we're going to touch on a breakdown of that in a second, but it shows you what cost you're claiming. And as a result of that, the total amount that should be repaid to you. Um, and then finally is the corporation tax return. So as you go, as all know, if you have limited companies every year, you will be submitting a corporation tax return, also called a CT600. So the actual mechanism of submitting an R&D claim, there isn't actually a kind of a R&D submission that you make. What actually happens is you amend your CT600 with a couple of figures that show your claim, tick a couple of boxes, attach the narrative and a calculation and that's actually the method of submitting an R&D claim there's not a separate submission as such um so yeah that, that's the three components of the claim which we'll jump into a bit more now uh if you could go to the next page please Ben thank you uh so yeah the technical narrative is essentially an essay uh, I tend to aim for two and a half to three and a half thousand words uh, any more than that normally mean kind of haven't summarized it succinctly enough and there's some views online that HMRC yeah, don't want to see something longer than that. Um, so yeah, the, these are the kind of different criteria I tend to break the narrative down. There's no fixed format you need to provide. This is just what I found works quite well. Um, is the yeah, first provide a company background. So a summary of what the company does, its history and its goals. I normally have a, a bit of information about the directors as well. 
the next would be r and D undertaken by the company. So I just provide a general overview of the R and D work that's been done in the year and how that then relates to the business's wider goals. Um, next is the pursuit of knowledge, not readily deductible by a competent professional. So that's a specific wording from HMRC that they kind of want to see demonstrated. As a result, I tend to have it as its own section. Um, and that is why the technology sought through R&D is not already publicly available and could not be easily deducted by a competent professional. So as you can see, that's kind of linking to the advancement in science and technology or demonstrating yeah, that criteria there. Um, next is te technological advances through research and development and the corresponding uncertainty. So this tends to make up the bulk of the claim and it should be an outline of how your R&D advanced science and technology and why there was uncertainty in what was done. Um, so I tend to break that out into a few different projects, but I think I'm actually gonna cover that in the next slide. So I'll, I'll jump back to that. Um, and then at the bottom, we then tend to outline the different costs claimed, as I kind of mentioned, React AWS. So to end the claim, we would have kind of staff cost section and we'd say, we have claimed staff costs based on the actual R&D work done. We've assessed every employee and you know, apply the percentage to the total salary, pension, and NI cost based on how much of their time was spent on R&D. We then do the same for contractors. And just to really explain to HMRC, yeah, what we've included. Um, not this isn't the figures because we'll do the figures in the calculation. It's more the kind of application we've given to each cost as to how we've assessed what should be included. Thank you. Um, so as the name suggests, the technical narrative should be as technical as possible. Uh, HMRC, they're not really interested in kind of time management, team structures, why what you're doing was, you know, any, any, any kind of fluff to what's been done isn't what they're after. What they want is real examples of the technical work that was done and highlighting why it's meeting the three criteria that we've keep touching on. So advanced science and technology, technically challenging and an element of uncertainty. Um, a good way to ensure a narrative contains enough technical content is to get input from the tech team that actually conducted the development. Often I see it's the founder or the CEO or even a slightly large company, often the CFO gets lumbered with it because um, obviously there is a HMRC submission, so it just typically gets uh, thrown to the CFO. But really the best people to be kind of writing a paragraph about why a certain element of R&D was a real challenge for them is the person that was actually doing it. So that's always, yeah. I'd get as much input from your tech team. The, the guy actually kind of writing the code is the best person to provide some input into that. Um, obviously, if you're if you are going to use an accountant, they'll write most of the narrative for you, but you still need the input from the business to kind of get that information over to you, whoever's doing the claim for you. Um, and my final tip is to not be too generic. So you're better off picking a few specific areas of your R and D work that are particularly technical where you yeah, had potential failures and had to kind of pivot and do new new approaches to succeed. That's what you want to focus on rather than just an overview of what you've done. Okay, so the calculation is the second document and this is where all of your costs need to be outlined um, and yeah, and a, a percentage applied to each of them. So I would always prepare an Excel or Google Sheets or you know some kind of spreadsheet software. Uh, there's no set format. I'm going to show you a kind of brief idea of how I normally do it. But it's good to break out each uh, expense category. So I'd have an expense category for staff costs. I then have each staff member listed. Um, I then have software, consumables, et cetera. Uh, for each eligible expense, I tend to have the total cost in one column, uh, then the percentage that I feel is eligible to R&D. And then from there, you have the enhancement. And again, this should make a bit more sense when I share the screenshot. But I kind of work across. And then your final column on the right should be what you're actually claiming back from HMRC. Uh, so, for example, if your CTO had a salary of £80,000 a year and they spent 80% of their time on R&D, you would show 80k in the first column for the total cost. You then have 64k in this next column. Well, I'd actually have 80% in between, then 64k, which is obviously 80k times 80%. Um, and then on the next column along, I'd have 83k, which is the 64, which is your uh, just standard expenditure. 83 is that multiplied by 130 uh, percent you then add them together which is your total expenditure and then the final column will be your total expenditure multiplied by 14.5 um, percent this logic should be applied for all the cost types but for subcontractors you just really need to remember to also multiply that by 65 percent uh, because that's the kind of 
restriction that has to be applied. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, then that will hopefully make a, a bit more sense of what I've just outlined here. So yeah, this is a very basic example of how I'd normally outline one. So in this situation, you've just got two employees, you've got two subcontractors, and you've got uh, one software provider. So yeah, you'd have your total cost. So that would be this. I've, I've used just a kind of round figure, but in reality, that total cost is probably going to be your uh, staff's salary plus their employer's national insurance plus your pension contributions for them. So it's it's unlikely to be a round number, but for this purpose, we're then saying they work 90% of the time in R&D, therefore 45,000 is the kind of applicable expenditure. The enhanced expenditure, which is that 130% we mentioned, is the next one. We then add them together, and then finally we multiply that by 14.5%. Um, and that's the same logic for all of them. The only thing to note is the subcontractors, you also have to multiply by 65%. So what I'm assuming there for the subcontractors is that they did 100% of their time on R&D, so 30,000, and then we applied it by 65. If you actually had a subcontractor who maybe did 50% of their time on R&D, you might need a second column, and what you do is you'd multiply the 30,000 by 50% and then by 65%. Um, yeah, I'll move on to the next slide, unless anyone... And I think this is probably quite a useful slide, but as Ben said, he's going to share. So, um, yeah, hopefully that will make sense. So this is getting somewhat technical here. I guess my caveat, and I think I have got a slide, when you're amending your CT600, unless you've got someone, uh, actually, okay, I've got this as a point at the bottom there, unless you've got someone in the business who's you know, a CFO or um, familiar with corporation tax returns, it's probably something I'd ask your accountant to look at or get someone to help with because it, it does get a bit technical. I've just provided some guidance here. So if, if you're, this is probably more to look back at in the future. If you're trying to amend your C2600, this is what you need to do. Uh, but I would be, as I say, wary of doing this if you're not familiar with preparing a C2600, is my, uh, is my caveat. Um, yeah, the, the adjustments you do need to make are to input your enhanced expenditure figure. So that's the 130% times the eligible costs. Um, and you want to put that into box 155. Or if you're a loss-making company, it'll be into 275. Uh, you then need to just cross or tick in box 650 to show that the claim you're making is an SME claim. Obviously, if you're doing an RDEC claim, uh, it's slightly different. Pro it's actually a, a bit more complicated, but kind of, yeah, out outside the scope of this presentation. Um, okay, because to be honest, you, you definitely need an accountant if you're going to do RDEC. Um, you then want to put your enhanced expenditure figure again into box 660. And if you're claiming a tax credit to actually been paid, so as in if you're a loss making business and you want to receive physical cash rather than an offset against your corporation tax, uh, you need to put the amount payable into box 530 and box 875. So that would be the far right column. I think I've highlighted it in yellow on the previous tab, uh, previous sheet, basically what you're reclaiming. Um, you also need to re fill in a supplementary page for R&D to request a repayment. And that page is quite self-explanatory, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, and then, yeah, my, my last comment there is just the, the caveat I opened with. Perfect. Um, so next thing just to cover, because it, it can impact some business, is um, the PAYE restriction. So this was put in place from 2021. And essentially what it means is the maximum tax credit the HMRC will pay, repay for each business is £20,000 plus 300% of the total PAYA and NI liability for the year. If, if, you're, if you have kind of staff on payroll at the moment, basically the amount you pay over to HMRC every month, um, or your accountant does, or your payroll providers do, um, it's that amount times 300%. So wherever you pay across the whole year, multiply that by three, add £20,000 uh, £20, to it. That's the maximum that the HMRC are going to pay to you every year. So if you're... If in a small claim and your claim is less than £20,000, yeah, no issue here anyway, because they'll pay out £20,000. Similarly, if you have a few staff on payroll and you're therefore paying tax over to HMRC every month, um, again, that's that minimum restriction is probably going to be quite high. People this tends to be an issue for is if you are paying hundreds of thousands of pounds a year to subcontractors, but no staff, then obviously the maximum HMRC you can pay you is £20,000. If you imagine if you have a million pound contract to bill and the max claim you can get is 33.35%, so £335,000 without this cap is what you would be able to claim. Instead, you can only pay 20, uh, claim £20,000. So 
It doesn't apply to most people, but for some people it can have a huge impact. The reason this was introduced is to stop the scheme being abused, to be honest. So if you have staff on payroll, you report that to HMRC every month. They know exactly who you're paying. They can verify it in multiple different ways and therefore they're willing to pay you a tax credit. Their concern is, you know, in theory, if this pay, uh, restriction wasn't in place, you could set up a company, you could claim a load of subcontractor costs and yeah, without restricting the HMRC could be paying that without really knowing if they're legitimate costs or not. Obviously they have other ways of checking, but they, yeah, it, it's an anti-abuse rule basically. Okay, so next thing I want to touch on is that HMRC inquiry. So once you've submitted your claim, HMRC will review it and decide whether to approve it. They won't review every submission in detail, but they do look at a significant portion of them. Um, and in my experience, the larger the claim, the more likely that they're gonna review it for, yeah, for obvious reasons. Yeah, if HMRC review the claim, and they're not confident that development you've done meets the criteria of research and development, or that some of the costs aren't eligible, they'll then look into that claim for an inquiry. Uh, there's a few different forms that this can take, but it tends to be they'll, they'll send a letter asking some additional information, they'll want proof of costs, and they'll probably query a few bits of the narrative to say, you've said you're doing this, but how is this advancing science and technology, for example, and I want an explanation. Um, quite often it, it can end with a call where they'll agree to, yeah, have a call with a director and a few other people in the team and discuss it and um, yeah, hopefully they're then satisfied. If not, they, in theory, you know, they can reject the claim. Um, to give a kind of example of likelihood of this, I've probably submitted a hundred claims and I've, I've only had one inquiry at one. Again, it kind of went the way we said, they, they sent us a letter, we sent some back, they pushed us again, we arranged a call, we discussed what had been done, they agreed, they were fine with it, everything got paid out. Um, so if, if, if you're making a legitimate claim, there's not really anything to worry about here. The main thing to worry about with HMRC inquiries, as you can imagine, they're not particularly fast moving. They, they send you a letter, they then, once you reply, they take another month to reply to the next one, then they arrange a call for a month's time. Um, so yeah, if you're doing legitimate R&D work, you don't really have to have any concern about not getting paid out. It's more that you, um, yeah, you might have to delay your claim a bit while you get that sorted. Okay. Um, so preparing and submitting an R&D claim, it can be complicated as potentially has been highlighted in this presentation. Um, and it, yeah, requires a certain degree of financial acumen. Uh, if you have somebody within the business, you know, CFO or an accountant, that kind of thing, they're normally going to be fine to prepare it. Um, as I've already alluded to, the adjustments of CT600 are probably the most complicated bit. Um, and yeah, we, we want to avoid an inquiry. Calculation is also fairly complex, but um, yeah, that's another reason. Um, and the other, the other reason is you actually may be able to claim more because if you've got an expert who's used to doing it, they can review p and and they might spot certain costs that you weren't aware that you could claim. And yeah, that, that could cover your kind of fee to whoever you're paying to do the claim alone. Um, the other reason, unlike the instance that HMRC worth launching inquiry, um, you know, it's normally a lot easier if you've got an accountant or so someone who knows what they're doing to manage that process to speak with HMRC. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just some extra support. So they're, they're reasons to use an accountant. I'd say it's kind of dependent on your situation. If you feel you've got some experience or you're comfortable doing it, there's no requirement to use an accountant, but they're obviously, you know, they're there for a reason and they can be quite helpful. Um, I think that's my last slide, apart from, yeah, if anyone has any any further questions. I think there is a couple more slides, but yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, if anyone has anything, happy to, happy to answer it. Can you hear hey. me? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. I've got a couple of questions. Um, we've always used the accountants to do our R&D claim and mm -hmm. they've always been successful. Is there a limit on how many years you can claim R&D? There, there's not technically a limit, but what HMRC would say is how how long can you actually be doing R&D work for, if you see what I mean? So if, if okay. you're always doing new projects in your narrative, that tends to be fine. But if you're doing one project, like we're building a back-end system to do X, Y, Z, after a certain number of years, HMRC will say, well, we're still doing that same, like, is this true R&D or have you, because it's that kind of science and uh, advancement in science and technology. They'll say, you must have hit that advancement now. And now you're just kind of building on that underlying technology. Like small iterations to that advancement aren't going to count. So that that's where the issue can be there. 
Okay. Also, um, we've noticed that things haven't been claimed for through the accountants. So I've read that you can go back for two years. Yes. Yeah, so the deadline for submitting a claim would be if, so it's two years from your year end. So yeah, if your financial year end was the 30th of September, 2021, uh, the deadline for submitting that claim is the 30th of September, 2023. Okay. But if it was already claimed in the year, but they hadn't claim they'd missed something off the claim yeah. that would just be when you would you then amend that ct 600 for that financial year yeah to be honest i've genuinely never had that instance actually where you know we've submitted one and then spotted other expenditures so an interesting one i think if if the claim if the costs were very minor i would probably put them into next year's claim instead of where maybe with a note but if it's something significant then yeah i would probably amend the existing CC600 with a new R&D claim, probably attach the covering letter to explain the situation because that's quite unusual. So yeah, if, okay. if you're talking a few thousand pounds of costs, I just stick into next year. It's, you know, you're not claiming, you're not doing anything but there. It's just things for everyone involved. But um, if it's significant, yeah, I'd probably, I mean, the year actually happened. That's great, thank you. Um, hi, Steve, I've got a question if that's all right. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's it's to oh, sorry, it's Alex. Yeah, I was the one peppering you with questions throughout the presentation. No, 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 it makes it makes it slightly more interesting than me just okay. reading the slide. No yeah. So, well, firstly, thanks for the presentation. It was, it was really informative. Um, I, 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 so, so the first question is, you you said it was technically challenging for a competent professional. Um, so for us, we had uh, a team that was made up part advisor, part. Um, uh, essentially uh, computer science grads so mm -hmm. you know for the grads it would be it was technically challenging um uh we, it was a machine learning project um so i uh, just that's the first question there i mean we had advisors assisting them um uh, on the machine learning project uh, but then you know i, I don't i mean it's a really small claim i've just done a quick calculation it's it's about it's about 2 2k it's it's re it's a really small. I mean, it would probably be negligible for HMRC. Uh, probably wouldn't even be worth their time challenging the claim. But um, on that first point, what are your thoughts? If it was a team that was made up of advisors assisting recent grads, are they considered competent professionals? Yeah, no, that that's not a problem. To be honest, anyone can do the claim. It's not to say that the person doing it has to have a certain level of expertise. It's to say that whatever that level of expertise expertise is, is pushing it if you see what i mean so what it's actually saying is for those computer grads was it technically like yeah for they would be considered a competent professional it's more is it pushing their upper limit or is it something that they could do you know they do every day and it's just their standard practice right. and it's in no way challenge for them so you know that that wouldn't be an issue to be honest right. if, if there's machine learning it's um typically going to be yeah fairly straightforward and then the second question is you know, I, I really don't want to defraud HMRC, even though it is a tiny claim, but our team was basically made up of seven people. Um, so we had, you know, essentially two people in software engineering, two people in data science and three people in machine learning. Now, if my claim is 2K or 1.9, um, so that's the amount that we would be claiming back in cash. Yeah. If you're set, you know, if the, the criteria... Um, that you set out, you know, advancing science, technically challenging, uh, an element of uncertainty, then the software engineers and the data scientists were feeding data to the machine learning um, team. And they were then, I mean, but it wouldn't have been possible without the supporting team work. So, yeah. I mean, how does that work? Should I be splitting should I be splitting the claim and actually not claiming for the software engineering and the data science, even though the project wouldn't have been possible without that? Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, that's that's close. That it's kind of borderline on whether that's. Uh, I would still view that as R and D because, as you say, it, yeah. it's it's still direct work on the R and D. I understand the point that it's yeah close to not meeting those criteria. In my opinion, that's that's still part of the general R and D project. So I, I would okay. say that's fine. If it's fine. a data scientist doing something, typically that's yeah quite a good uh, good indicator that that's R and D work compared to you know a chief marketing officer, for example. Like it, right. yeah, they're, they're, yeah, I would not have an issue with that. Awesome, really appreciate your input, Steve. Thank you so much. No worries. And so, just to answer your last question, is there anywhere that it's possible to get 
examples of existing claims, etc. Speaks comes that have offered to help us with R and D claims. They've said that we wouldn't be entitled to see the claim. Presumably, so that we've tied to them rather than trying to. Um, yeah, R and D. There, it's a murky business at the moment. Um, in terms of, there is a lot of, and I, I imagine all of you guys get um, get approached by them. There's some companies charging really high fees and also locking people in for three years. Um, yeah, we, we don't do that at all. I think our fees lower than quite a bit lower than average. And yeah, we don't lock anyone in. We just we'll, we'll do it for you if you want to return to us. Great. If not, we yeah, it's it's how I've to be honest. There's no, there's no real reason that I've just always run a business like that for all, all of our services. Um, and yeah, as a result, we send you all, I, to be honest, I want my clients to see all of the documents we're submitting. Because I ask you guys to approve it all um, if, if we're doing a claim for someone. So yeah, that we definitely share absolutely everything we've got with you. And yeah, it would you'd view it all before we submit anyway. Yeah, that sort of rang alarm bells with other companies where they're sort of like, oh yeah, what you do is you give us a login to HMRC and we, we you know, we write it and we submit it uh and you don't get to see yeah. it it's like, okay not not so sure on that that yeah. seems yeah there's um, a few I, guess, say, I, I presume it's so that you can't then kind of go oh well now we've got documents from last year we just need to tweak the numbers this year change the wording a little bit and resubmit kind of thing i'm guessing that that's what they're trying to try to prevent yeah which is is a i guess it is a risk from my from my side as the accountant but yeah to be honest we just that's how we're happy to work um i think my other advice is if you're gonna use a company I'd be wary of any that aren't kind of ICAW or kind of, yeah, CTA, basically some kind of professional qualification regulated. So yeah, ICAW as an example. Um, there's a lot of kind of yeah, nefarious firms about that aren't proper accountants. They've just learned how to do R&D claims. Um, and, you know, they're, they're probably fine for the vast majority. I just personally would want to go with the yeah, kind of proper accountancy firm. Okay, yeah, if, if that's everything, um, I think we can yeah, we can close out there. But um, as Ben said, I think he's going to share my details. So, um, yeah, if anyone does have any other questions, just feel free to contact me and I'll pass back to Ben now. Thank you very much for joining today's workshop with Othership. It's been great to have you here. Any presentation material that was shared with you today will be emailed out to you afterwards, along with links on how you can follow up, learn more about Othership and get in contact with your expert from today. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you in another ship workspace in Slack or around the community.